1981 was eight years before I was born, bit of a giveaway on my age, so I've had to rely on an oh so comprehensive Google search to get some idea of what life was like. But Prince Charles and Princess Diana got engaged, Ricky Villa's wonder goal in the FA Cup, John McEnroe did his notorious You Cannot Be Serious tirade. You can't be serious, man. You cannot be serious! You cannot, cannot. You cannot be serious. But at the same time, there was something perplexing medicine. There were clusters of gay men across LA, New York, and San Francisco that were getting sick in a way that hadn't been seen before. These cases were the first reports of what would go on to be called AIDS. Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome. Now credit for bringing this to light and into the mainstream is often given to an article in the New York Times published in July of 1981. And we've just passed the 40 year anniversary. But this article was far from the be all and the end all. On this video, I want to look at the lead up to this article. And in particular, I want to focus on the clinicians that were already raising the alarm about this, who frankly, I don't think get the credit that they really deserve. Lawrence Altman wrote this piece called Rare Cancer Seen in 41 Homosexuals in the New York Times on the 3rd of July of 1981. It focused on these clusters of cases where gay men were being diagnosed with a type of cancer called Kaposi sarcoma. This is caused by human herpes virus 8 or HHV8 and well it wasn't exactly new. It was first discovered by Moritz Kaposi back in 1872 so there was some familiarity with it already but these cases completely changed our fundamental understanding. Before this Kaposi sarcomas were thought to be confined to parts of sub-Saharan Africa and into people that had received organ transplants and therefore were on some powerful immunosuppressants. It was thought to be slow growing, appeared predominantly on the legs, and if it was affecting men, they were usually older men. To be honest, most doctors had probably never seen a case outside of a textbook. And the fact that the pigmentation meant it actually looks quite similar to a simple bruise means that cases were probably getting missed. Now though, it was appearing in these clusters of younger gay men, often alongside other sexually transmitted infections. And rather than slow growing, this was progressing rapidly. Now this was odd, these cancers were being seen in clusters, yet cancer isn't contagious, is it? Apparently none of these 41 people knew each other, there were no acknowledged cases in women or heterosexuals, and when they tested their blood, they found that they were deficient in two types of immune cells called B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes. Now today we know exactly why that's the case, but at this time, no idea. Was this weakening of the immune system a cause of the cancer or a consequence of the cancer? While this article may have been the turning point for raising awareness about this mystery illness circulating within parts of the population, it didn't tell anywhere near the whole story. It discussed evidence against the idea of a contagious cause. It said there was no danger to non-homosexuals. On the same day as Lawrence Altman's article came out, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention published its own coverage of this outbreak in one of its newsletters called the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. What a cheery piece of reading that must be. So it wasn't just the mainstream press that were picking this up, the powers that be in the scientific world were as well. But this wasn't the first time they'd published it. A month earlier, in this same newsletter, they'd published about a cluster of five cases seen of a rare type of infection called pneumocystis pneumonia, or PCP. Again, seen in gay men in Los Angeles. So clearly stuff was happening in the lead up to this mainstream article in the New York Times. Arguably one of the first physicians to really be writing about this is Dr. Lawrence Mass, who was a medical writer and a physician. Through colleagues and his own practice, he'd become aware of these clusters of cases of Kaposi sarcoma. And in May of 1981, he contacted the CDC about it, trying to raise the alarm and basically told that this idea of a gay cancer was basically just a rumor and was completely unfounded. And that led to a shady article that he wrote called Disease Rumors Largely Unfounded, published in an LGBT publication called The New York Native. Michael Gottlieb was an assistant professor of immunology at the University of California in LA. And he was looking for interesting cases to use as teaching tools at the time and came across one really intriguing case of a young man who was gay with unexplained weight loss, fevers, and oral thrush, a fungal infection in the mouth and the throat caused by candida. Now most people don't get oral thrush. There's usually a reason. Nowadays, inhaled steroids that use asthma can predispose to it. But another thing that can cause it is a defect in one of those immune cells that we spoke about earlier 
called the T lymphocytes. So they tested the blood of this man. His T cells were super low. In particular, there was a subtype of T cell called CD4 T cells, otherwise known as T helper cells, that were pretty much absent. The T helper cells, I kind of think, as the conductors of the immunological orchestra. They don't sort of play any instruments themselves. They don't do the dirty work and get rid of the bugs themselves, but they coordinate all other parts of the immune system to help manage infections and cancers in the most efficient and coordinated way possible with as little friendly fire as possible. Without them, all the other cells of the immune system kind of don't really know what to do. And the patient went on to develop some more what we call opportunistic infections. So these are infections that occur when the immune system is particularly weak. And this included this rare type of pneumonia called pneumocystis pneumonia that's caused by the fungus pneumocystis durovecchi. Until this point, generally only seen in children with genetic causes of an immune deficiency or people that have received an organ transplant and are on powerful immunosuppressants. So much like with Kaposi's sarcoma, seeing clusters of PCP really challenged our perception of what this illness was and what caused it. Over the next five months, he'd seen a total of five cases of this. They were all deficient in those CD4 T cells. At least one of them also had another opportunistic infection in the lung by cytomegalovirus. And some of them also then went on to develop Kaposi's sarcoma. He was pretty sure he was onto something New. In his own words, this was a story bigger than the discovery of Legionnaires. And like most high-flying academics, where do you want to publish it? The New England Journal of Medicine. That's like the pinnacle, right? But while it's under its lengthy, time-consuming peer review, he was advised to publish a shorter article in that newsletter, the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, by the CDC. This is designed to try and get the word out to clinicians about this new mystery illness. And it also means that he gets his name on this and gets some credit for it. No one else can sort of swoop in while this other paper's under peer review. This is about a month before the New York Times article came out. And frankly, it didn't really get the traction and the attention that it really deserved. Another clinician called Alvin Friedman Kean then published a case series about these clusters of Kaposi sarcomas in LA, New York, and San Francisco that went on to be the basis of Lawrence Altman's article in the New York times and we've seen the whole story now come full circle. Lawrence Mass trying to raise the alarm and the CDC saying eh, nothing to worry about. Michael Gottlieb going hmm there's something new here. Paper under peer review but otherwise the mainstream media not really interested. Alvin Friedman Kean's case series leading to that New York Times article now people are starting to give it the attention that it needs. When Gottlieb's New England Journal article came out in December of 1981, it did get some good attention about this new transmissible form of immune deficiency likely sexually transmitted. Question was, what was actually causing it. One thing they postulated was, was it this cytomegalovirus, CMV? Was there a new strain of this that was perhaps suppressing the immune system? Now, with hindsight, we know that the CMV is yet another type of opportunistic infection. By September of 1982, the CDC had officially coined the term AIDS, so Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, not before the perhaps less politically correct gay-related immune deficiency. They changed the name once they realized that this wasn't just confined to gay and bi men. Science was starting to focus on the idea that there was this reduced function in the T-cells in AIDS. Another condition where T-cell function is impaired is leukemia. And they noticed that the T-cells were reduced in some patients with leukemia where inside the cells there were these structures called retroviruses. RNA viruses that are converted back to DNA, they then incorporate themselves in the genetic material of the cells in our body that allow it to replicate. So it was hypothesized that retroviruses might be the cause of AIDS. In 1983, Montagnier in Paris discovered human immunodeficiency virus 1, HIV-1, a retrovirus that was present in the lymph nodes of people with what they called at the time pre-AIDS, early signs of AIDS without profound immune deficiency and all the opportunistic infections that came with it. It seemed to be affecting T cells, but not other cells. But then two other groups, one in Bethesda, Maryland, and one in San Francisco, went on to replicate these findings. Together, these three groups further characterized HIV-1 and were able to establish a causal link between it and AIDS. Each group gave the virus a slightly different name, kind of depended on the groups of people they were studying it in, or its similarity to other viruses at the time. Lymphadenopathy associated virus, human T cell leukemia virus number three, or HTLV3, and AIDS associated retrovirus. But in 1986, a consensus was made to call it HIV1, and Montagnier and his colleague Barry Sanusi, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, received the Nobel Prize for the discovery of HIV1 in 
in 2008. Today our understanding continues to evolve. We're actually moving away from using the term AIDS and instead characterizing people with HIV based on the number of CD4 T cells that they have. The lower the number, the more vulnerable they are to infection. Over the last few years, we've seen the number of new diagnoses starting to fall. There's even targets to try and eradicate HIV as a whole by 2030. We've got wonderful antiretroviral medications that mean one pill a day can keep the virus at bay and give you an immune system that is basically as strong as somebody without the virus. But not only that, we now have pre-exposure prophylaxis on the NHS to try and prevent acquiring the infection rather than just treating it and managing it once it happens. The HIV epidemic is just sort of this, this horror story that happened pretty much before my time, before my awareness that I'm sort of going back and trying to catch up on and learn about. But it also represents a time of absolutely wonderful medical advancement and shows you just how amazing science and medicine can be.